SpaceX's next-generation Starship vehicle rolls for testing, NASA completes the first aircraft crash investigation on another planet, ESA plans to support India's human spaceflight missions, and Virgin Galactic may be flying from Italy? As always, we'll have all that and a whole lot more this week in Spaceflight. NASA is continuing preparations for the launch of its Artemis II mission. Last week, we covered the major news of this mission, with the delay of the launch to April 2026 and the release of the findings into the Orion heat shield ablation on Artemis I. Now, that was all, of course, detailed on last week's episode, so check that out for further discussion. But since then, there have been a few other events related to the mission. One of them was the transfer of the SLS core stage for the mission from the transfer aisle inside the vehicle assembly building to High Bay 2, also within the building. For this operation, teams from the Exploration Ground Systems lifted the core stage using the VAB's bridge cranes, which then translated the vehicle over to a new vertical workstation inside High Bay 2. High Bay 2 is one of the four bays inside of the VAB, and it was used during Apollo mainly as a storage location, although it did host the stacking of Apollo 10 and Skylab. Then, during the shuttle program, it was used for processing of external tanks ahead of launch. Originally, NASA wasn't planning to use this high bay for SLS, but the agency and Boeing, the stage main contractor, decided to change the way in which core stages are built. Since the SLS engine section is very complicated and takes up processing space at the Mashoud assembly facility, Boeing decided to free up this space by keeping the manufacturing at Mashoud, but moving the processing to the VAB, where engine and tank sections would be mated together before integration with the rest of the rocket. This connection would take place in High Bay 2, and that's what this bay is now being used for and why there's now a workstation inside of it. While that new way of building core stages won't start until Artemis 3, the agency is still using this new stand to process the core stage for Artemis 2. In parallel, teams are also stacking the solid rocket boosters for SLS onto the mobile launcher, and once that work is done, the core stage will be installed in between them. So the earlier they get this processing done, the less work needs to be done after installation with the SRBs. It's no secret that Artemis 2's launch readiness hinges on Orion, but at least that part of the program is making progress too. The agency announced this week that the Orion spacecraft for Artemis 2 has completed a second round of vacuum testing at the operations and check out building at KSC. Right after this testing was completed, Orion's crew module was fitted with its main batteries, and in a few weeks, teams from the European Space Agency will install the solar array wings on Orion's service module. Along with progress for the Artemis II mission, NASA continues to make progress adding in even more countries who support the agency's Artemis Accords. The latest two countries to join were Panama and Austria, which make them the 49th and 50th countries to join the Accords since they were begun back in 2020. The Artemis Accords are a set of principles put forward by the U.S. that are meant to promote the beneficial use of space for humanity. While many questions remain about the future of SLS and Orion, it's safe to say that at least this sentiment of international cooperation in space is definitely present. This week, SpaceX rolled the Starship vehicle set to fly on the company's seventh Starship test flight out for engine testing. This vehicle, Ship 33, is the first ship of the next generation of Starships to fly. The vehicle includes thousands of upgrades and changes, including a redesigned heat shield, a new forward flap design, lower dry mass, and more propellant capacity, among others. We were able to see many of these upgrades during this rollout, since the previous ones all happened at night and at an earlier step of the processing flow. Ship 33 completed cryogenic proof testing back in October and received engines just last month. These engines, which are still Raptor 2 engines, will now be tested while attached to the vehicle on the engine test stand located at the Massey outpost. Unlike with tests at the launch site, tests at Massey's don't require the closing of Highway 4, which also makes it more complicated for us to guess when this testing might happen, but it could take place over the next few days and we will definitely be keeping an eye on that. In fact, it turns out SpaceX performed the first round of testing just as I was getting ready to record this episode on Thursday night. We just had what appeared to be a spin prime test of the ship's engines. Uh, that's what you get for covering developing stories. Now, in case you don't know, a spin prime test is a test in which the oxidizer turbo pumps on all the engines are spun up, but no ignitions take place on either the fuel or oxidizer pre-burners, and even much less goes on in the main combustion chamber. We're not sure how many more tests, or even what type of tests, we'll see when Ship 33 is at Massey's. With previous vehicles, SpaceX has decided to move straight into a static fire test, but with this being a whole new design of the ship, it's very likely there'll be multiple tests leading up 
up to the static fire. As I mentioned before, this is kind of a developing story, so all of this can change. Maybe pull up Starbase Live and check it out every now and then just to make sure you don't miss anything. But of course, we'll also have a full rundown and update next week on our next Starbase Update episode. This rollout follows the completion of engine testing of the Super Heavy booster that will fly with Ship 33, which is Booster 14. This vehicle underwent a spin prime test at the launch site on December 7th, and then completed a static fire test on December 9th, bringing Raptor's engine fury back to the launch mount less than 20 days after Starship's sixth flight. That vehicle has since rolled back to the production site, where it'll be prepared for flight. A flight for which we have no updated information when it comes to schedules. You might remember that a few weeks ago, we talked about a document between NASA and the FAA that said January 11th was the tentative launch date for this flight. But that document was dated before Flight 6 took place, so there's a good chance that it may not be true anymore. And sadly, we've not yet seen any updated information regarding schedules. So with all of this testing progress, when do you think Flight 7 might happen? Will it stick to January 11th or will it delay until later? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you want to keep up to date with everything spaceflight, don't forget to like and subscribe and tune in whenever we go live. And now we'll take a glimpse at some other stories across space, starting with NASA's Mars helicopter, Ingenuity. Now, if you followed along with the little helicopter that could, you'll remember that it crashed onto the Martian surface earlier this year. NASA lost communications with the helicopter near the end of its fatal 70-second flight, and when engineers managed to contact Ginny again, they discovered that its rotor blades had been severely damaged. NASA started an investigation into the crash, and now the results are in. The reconstruction showed that the culprit was the terrain Ginny was flying over during its final flight. Unlike the five originally planned flights, this one flew over steep sand ripples that lacked features for Ingenuity's navigation system to track. NASA's analysis showed that this became a problem 20 seconds after takeoff. The confused navigation system sent Ginny sideways, followed by a hard landing on a slope. This changed the helicopter's attitude beyond what the rotor blades could manage, causing them to break. Doss and I had the opportunity to interview Ingenuity's chief engineer, Travis Brown, on Astro Live back in March, and here's how he explained it. We just came down really hard, and the gyroscopic forces on the blades were more than they could handle. You know, they're spinning again at like 26 plus 100 RPM. So if you suddenly touch down and you have a very big change in roll, that, it, that exerts a huge gyroscopic force. We snapped the blade. <laughs> Chuck the blade off to the west. Like way off to the west. Once we have a blade missing, this thing is horrendously imbalanced and just washing machined itself down the, the yeah. dune. Now, of course, we're all sad that we lost Ingenuity, but its mission was a massive success. Instead of the planned five flights, Ginny flew a whopping 72 times. It may no longer be able to fly, but it is still working away on the Martian surface, sending a weather report to Perseverance. Eventually, the two will lose contact, but for now, Ingenuity is still sending useful data to engineers and scientists back here down on Earth. This week, the German rocket company High Impulse announced they're developing a space tug to complement its upcoming small launch vehicle, SL-1. The tug, named High Move, will allow the company to deploy multiple satellites into different orbital planes with only a single launch. And it can also perform orbital insertion, last mile payload delivery, and even host payloads itself. High Move will be powered by hybrid propulsion, just like SL-1 and High Impulse's suborbital sounding rocket named SR-75. Now, if you want to learn more about these rockets, High Impulse's paraffin-powered hybrid rocket motor, and the company's other plans, well, we've got just the show for you. In this week's NSF Live on Europe's future in space, Alex and Dee interviewed High Impulse CEO and co-founder Christian Schmierer. We'll throw a link on screen and in the description for you. High Impulse also announced that it's already found a customer for High Move's first missions. The company partnered with Slovak small satellite company Space Manic to launch up to 10 missions between 2026 and 2036. High Impulse expects to wrap up ground testing of the space tug next year and to start flying High Move on commercial missions in 2029. This week, Stoke Space tested the first stage engine for its Nova rocket, but this one was special. The hot fire test was the first of the new version of the engine, Block 2, which integrates the the flight layout into its design compared to the engine design that had been tested until now. This engine is a complex engine, working on the full-flow staged combustion cycle, just like SpaceX's Raptor, and it's only the third engine of its kind in history to hit the test stand. Getting to test it in a flight configuration is quite a big deal for the company as it prepares for a debut flight of Nova, hopefully in 2025. The test was also the first static fire test from the company's new vertical stand, which was just a hole in the ground half a year ago. With this pace of progress, it's safe to say we'll see a lot more activity from Stoke in no time. 
India is building up its own human spaceflight program with the Gaganyaan spacecraft, but the country isn't doing it alone, and it has in fact partnered with other countries to aid and support their efforts. This week, the European Space Agency announced a partnership with the Indian Space and Research Organization to provide ground station coverage for Gaganyaan's first three flights, the last of which will be crewed. This partnership will allow the spacecraft to communicate and transmit telemetry to the ground via ESA's European Space Tracking Network when out of sight of India's own ground stations. The agencies will soon work on frequency capability testing at the European Space Operations Center in Germany to ensure that the spacecraft can communicate with ESA's network. Now, this isn't the first partnership between both agencies for communications with Earth. ESA supported communications during India's Chandrayaan-3 mission to the moon, and it continues to support downlink of data from the country's Aditya L1 solar observatory. Virgin Galactic may soon fly from… Italy? This week, the company announced that it's partnering with the Italian Civil Aviation Authority to study the feasibility of conducting operations from Italy. In particular, these operations would take place from the Grotalia spaceport in the Puglia region of southern Italy. The feasibility study will look at the compatibility of Virgin Galactic's operations with the region. This includes looking at the airspace regulations, the traffic, and restrictions in place, as well as studying the ground infrastructures at the site. Virgin Galactic previously had ties with Italy when the company flew members of the Italian Air Force on the Galactic 01 mission back in June of 2023, marking the company's first commercial spaceflight. Until now, the company has operated from Mojave and Spaceport America, with all of the operational flights taking place from the latter site. This partnership would add another location for the company to operate from, and would definitely give its passengers a different view than what's possible from New Mexico. It feels like we feature Vast almost every week, but the company just keeps making progress and announcing new things! This week in particular, we got news that the company has completed the primary structure qualification article for its Haven 1 station. According to Vast, this qualification article, quote, is now ready for painting, window, and hatch integration before being shipped for pressure and load testing at our Mojave test site. This test stand is currently being prepared for that round of testing, in which the qualification test article will be subjected to loads and internal pressures similar to those during flight and on-orbit operations. Recently, Vast also released a shot of the shielding on Haven 1 that will be installed to protect against micrometeoroid and orbital debris, often referred to as MMOD. Vast even released a slow-motion video of this shield in action during testing. The shield is made of two layers, one outer layer of aluminum and a composite layer underneath over the pressure hull of the station. Here's hoping it's never needed, though. Now let's take a look at the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week on December 8th, SpaceX launched a batch of Starlinks from Florida. Falcon 9 lifted off from the Cape at 512 UTC with 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites in its fairing, 13 of which had direct-to-cell capability. The booster on this mission was B-1086, which flew for the second time. It first flew as one of the side boosters on the Gozu Falcon Heavy mission in June, and this is now the second Falcon Heavy side booster that SpaceX converted to fly as a regular Falcon 9. The first was B-1052, which started its life on two Falcon Heavy missions, then flew five times on its own and ended up flying as an expendable side booster on the Viasat 3 Falcon Heavy flight. B-1086 still has more missions ahead of it now, as it landed successfully on SpaceX's drone ship a short fall of Gravitas. With this flight, SpaceX has launched a total of 7,546 Starlink satellites, of which 681 have re-entered over the course of the program, and 6,073 Starlink satellites have moved into their operational orbit. We also had a launch from China this week. On December 12th at 7.17 Universal Time, a Chongzheng 2D lifted off from the Zhouchuan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket lifted five payloads into low Earth orbit and reportedly into three different orbital planes. The mission name roughly translates to High Speed Laser Diamond Constellation Test System, and based on this, it seems that the five satellites will test laser communications technology. That's about all we know, as no further details about the constellation or the customer have been made public. Later in the week, NASA's Lucy spacecraft flew by Earth for a brief visit. When it passed by our planet, it stole the slightest amount of Earth's orbital energy to increase its speed by 7.31 kilometers per second a maneuver known as a gravity assist. On December 13th at 4.15 Universal Time, Lucy screamed past the Earth a mere 360 kilometers above the ocean west of California. That's so close, the spacecraft had to adjust its orientation to avoid being destabilized by the thin traces of atmosphere up there. This was the second of these maneuvers since Lucy launched in October of 2021. The first happened exactly one year after its launch. 
This week's quick visit changed Lucy's path to intercept the Jupiter Trojan asteroids, a group of asteroids that orbit the Sun in a stable position at the same distance as Jupiter, leading the giant planet in its path around the Sun. The new and carefully planned trajectory should take Lucy through the asteroid belt first, flying past the asteroid Donald Johansson. Arrival at the Trojans is scheduled for 2027, and once there, Lucy is set to swing by and study no less than four asteroids before its path takes it back to Earth in 2030. But that's not the end of the mission. A third and, according to the current schedule, final flyby of our planet puts Lucy on a course towards the other group of Trojans that trail Jupiter in its orbit. Lucy is expected to arrive there 12 years into its mission in 2033. The next few launches were scheduled to take off around the time we published this episode or shortly thereafter, so they might already have happened by the time this episode gets to you. The first is another Starlink launch, scheduled to lift off from California on December 13th between 1910 and 2310 UTC. This time, Falcon 9 is loaded with 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites destined for low Earth orbit. Next up is a HASTE mission from Wallops Island in Virginia. HASTE is the suborbital variant of Rocket Lab's Electron, which is used to fly hypersonic test missions. T0 for this launch is set to occur during a 4 hour and 15 minute window, starting at 45 past midnight UTC on December 14th. As usual for these missions, we don't have much information to go off of, but airspace restrictions mention the mission under the name Stonehenge. Then there's a Falcon 9 mission scheduled from Florida. Liftoff is set for 104 Universal Time on December 14th from Space Launch Complex 40. On official documentation, this mission shows up as RRT-1. We don't know what this means, but we suspect that the payload might be the GPS-3 SV-10 satellite as it matches up with the published trajectory and hazard zones. If it is indeed the GPS-3 satellite, RRT-1 might stand for Rapid Response Test 1, or maybe Retro Reflective Target 1, as this is the first GPS satellite to feature a laser retro reflector array from NASA. But it could also mean something totally different, too. Hopefully, we'll get more information, and if we do, we'll let you know on next week's episode. Not too long after that, we should have the second flight of Space One's Kairos rocket during a 20-minute window opening at 2 o'clock UTC. The rocket is expected to lift off from the Japanese company's own spaceport, Spaceport Key, in Japan's Wakayama Prefecture. This mission carries five technology demonstration satellites to a sun-synchronous orbit. The solid-fueled rocket's first flight in March didn't go so well as it exploded five seconds after liftoff. The autonomous flight termination system triggered when it detected that Kairos didn't perform as expected. We wish Space One better luck this time. After several weather-induced delays, SpaceX's CRS-31 Cargo Dragon is now scheduled to return from the International Space Station on December 14th. The spacecraft is set to autonomously undock from the station's Harmony module at 16.05 Universal Time and return back to Earth for a splashdown off the coast of Florida the very next day. We'll also have a Chongzheng 2D launch on December 14th. This mission is set to lift off from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in China around 1800 UTC. Next up, on December 15th, we'll have another Falcon 9 launch. This one will be conducted from the Kennedy Space Center, with liftoff expected during a nearly two-hour window starting at 2058 UTC. This time, Falcon will carry two second-generation O3B M-Power satellites to medium Earth transfer orbit for SES. The next Falcon 9 is scheduled to launch from Vandenberg on December 16th during a four-hour window opening at 9.33 UTC. The payload is suspected to be the sixth batch of Starshield satellites for the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office. Later that day, a Chongzheng 5B is expected to lift off from the Wenchang Space Launch Site in China. The two-hour and 14-minute window for that launch opens on December 16th at 10 o'clock Universal Time. Then the next day, we'll have an Electron launch from Rocket Lab's own spaceport in New Zealand. Liftoff is set for a one-hour and 15-minute window starting at 1400 UTC on December 17th. The mission is called Owl the Way Up, and if you're familiar with Rocket Lab's mission names, you might have guessed that the payload will be another strict satellite for Synspective. Back in Florida, another Falcon 9 is scheduled to launch on December 18th. The launch window for this mission opens at 3.38 UTC and lasts 4 hours and 19 minutes. Onboard Falcon 9 will be four micro-geo satellites for Astronus. These are much smaller than most geostationary satellites, so Falcon will deploy them closer to their target geostationary orbit. And wrapping up the week, we'll have a spacewalk on the International Space Station. On December 19th, cosmonauts Alexei Ovchinin and Ivan Wagner are set to leave the station for 6 hours and 40 minutes, starting at 1510 UTC. During the spacewalk, the cosmonauts are tasked with removing some science experiments from the station's exterior and relocating hardware for the European robotic arm. 
And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.